Bona tarda a tothom. Benvinguts. Gràcies per venir. Us faré una mica d'introducció de la Pati. És un plaer per mi, per la sal, per introduir-vos, Dr. Pati Maes. Aquest any, part del meu grup de recerca, i jo mateix, ha tingut l'oportunitat de visitar i treballar a la seva lab. If you ever visit Medilab, uh, you will see in the entrance near the, near the door, you will see a text on the wall uh, where it's written a sentence that say, how to integrate the wall of information and services more naturally into our daily physical life, enable, enabling insight, inspiration, and interpersonal connections signed by Patty Maes. This sentence uh, summarizes her career and works as a leitmotiv for or between uh, her students. I think this vision uh, started during the 90s when she found and ran the software agents group also at Media Lab. Uh, and at that time, she also founded a company called Firefly with powerful software that offered you purchase recommendations based on your behavior in the internet. Nowadays, Patty Mais is the Alexander Dreyfus Professor at Middle Art MIT. She founded and directs the Fluid Interfaces Group. She has named it one of the 50 most influential designers. Newsweek Magazine named her one of the 100 Americans to watch for. Time Magazine selected her as a member of the Cyber Elite. The World Economic Forum honored her with the title of Global Leader for Tomorrow and a long, long list of awards. Uh, we are very grateful to Obra Social La Caixa, who has sponsored this conference. And of course, also we are uh, very thankful to Patti Maes for being here to explain us how they design fluid interfaces. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I have uh, had the honor of working with a couple of students from La Salle University for the last couple of years, and I've been very impressed uh, by um, uh, their sort of level of education and their work spirit and so on. So it's really a pleasure to be here and see where they uh, come from. It's also the first time I have a robot listening to me in the audience. <laughs> Hopefully it's not going to steal the show too much. I hope I can be more interesting Oops, than the robot. Um, let me know if this is a problem. So I don't have to tell you that um, basically computers and digital devices are becoming indispensable. We use them for every aspect of our lives, the way we work, the way we communicate, play, express ourselves, learn, socialize, engage in politics, uh, take care of our health and well-being and so on. So we are becoming increasingly dependent on our smartphones, laptops, uh, iPads, etc. Yet, at the same time, the way we interact with these devices hasn't really changed in many, many years. Uh, you may have heard that just this last week, unfortunately, one of the pioneers of computer science, um, Douglas Engelbart, uh, passed away, unfortunately. Um, he was really the person who created or who invented the way we interface and interact with computers today. He invented not just a mouse, but Windows, even Skype, many, many years before Skype uh, really took off. Um, so he's, he's really, um, he sort of built the first or designed the first personal computer experience, but this wasn't really um, one personal computer yet. That took many more years, actually, in 1981. Um, Xerox sort of uh, developed a commercial prototype of a personal computer, which was very much just the vision of Doug Engelbart uh, implemented and, and made available to the masses. And then, of course, even though that one didn't, uh, wasn't so successful, 
Apple uh, sort of took a lot of those ideas and uh, that's when the uh, personal computer that we know today and the way we interact with them really took off. Now in the um, 40 or 50 years since that interaction with computers was invented by Doug Engelbart, it hasn't really changed much at all. The only sort of significant change maybe is the touch screen. But other than that, we are still using a mouse and a keyboard and windows. And um, we're still really uh, um, working with computers the way Doug uh, Engelbart um, envisioned it back then. And the same is true, by the way, for um, um, our smartphones. So I think that it's actually time <laughs> to change this or to rethink the way we interact with computers because today's devices um, have a lot of limitations. One of the limitations is that they are uh, effectively blind. So my um, uh, computer here um, or my smartphone uh, over there doesn't really know much about my context, about what I'm doing. It, um, it doesn't, or at least it, it has the potential to know that I'm talking to an audience here, that I am in Barcelona. It could look at my uh, calendar and see that I'm giving a talk here and so on. But the devices today don't really use any of this information. They're effectively blind and just waiting for us to tell them what to do. So it's like a hammer which you have to pick up and then hit a nail with, um, the device is totally passive until we tell it, now do this, now go to that app or open that app and so on. And using um, these devices is very disruptive. It's ha very hard for me to, um, when I meet somebody here today, shake their hand and then quickly maybe take out my phone and Google them or find out who they are or what they work on or whatever. So using a, a device, a computer device or a smartphone is completely disruptive. It requires that your entire attention is focused on the device. And I think that it's time to change this because we live in these two worlds, in the physical world and we live in the world of information. And right now, the two are not at all connected. And uh, the experience is really uh, a very um, uh, odd one. Uh, so I'm proposing that the devices, that we should try to invent new devices for making use of all this rich information, all these wonderful services, and that the devices that we invent should be much more perceptive or much more aware of where they are, what the person is doing, what the person is looking at or who they are looking at, what are they talking about, uh, what are their hands doing, etc. So that the device can take a more proactive role in offering information and services that could be useful and so that the uh, use of all this information can be a lot more seamless and a lot more integrated in our daily physical lives. So the goal of my research group at MIT is really to invent, design and invent and implement new um, basically technologies that give us a more seamless experience for using digital information and services in our daily lives. And what I'll do today is um, talk about some of the experiments that we have been doing. Um, we don't have sort of one particular project that um, say is the be uh, all and end all of uh, uh, that is solving all of these problems. What we do is we experiment a lot, have several big projects going on where we uh, sort of uh, think of a new way of interacting with information and try to implement it, prototype it, solve some of the hard problems, but mostly uh, evaluate whether that style of interaction could be um, sort of could offer a more seamless experience and a more uh, sort of usable experience uh, for using information. So one of these projects, but I'll talk about multiple, but the one that is probably the most known is um, a device that we um, came up with um, in 2009 called uh, the Sixth Sense, and it consists of a small projector, a Pico projector, and a camera. 
And the camera can basically track the user's uh, hands and uh, uh, it can also recognize uh, some gestures and can actually um, recognize some of the objects that the user may be holding. And the projector actually projects information onto either the hands or uh, the objects that the person holds. And um, it doesn't just project information, it allows the user to interact with that information. So for example here, if you pick up a book, you basically, the user has told the system that every time a book is recognized, he wants to see the Amazon rating for that book. Or you can see um, maybe audio. Can we have the audio? Uh -oh. I think the audio is not on. Is the audio on for the video? To outstanding MIT professors. Yeah. Eric Sorry. Maybe you'll hear it now. So basically, you can get audio as well as visual augmentations of um, whatever you're holding in your hands. So when you uh, pick up the newspaper, you can see the latest weather report. When you pick up a boarding pass, the system can uh, tell you that your gate has been changed, etc. Uh, you could potentially even show um, uh, projected onto other people uh, what their particular interests are and so on. <laughs> that one is a little bit controversial. Um, but so the whole idea here really is that um, you can really sort of integrate the digital world and the physical world in one experience and it becomes one and the same um, experience. So you can augment paper, just use any piece of paper as uh, an interface basically. Um, maybe watch a video game on a piece of paper or uh, use a piece of paper as your computer and so on. Um, so that was the whole vision of the system. So here, good afternoon. We're just My watching name is a little Russell, uh, video. And I am a wilderness explorer in Tribe 54. Or you can play a video game where the way you hold the piece of paper determines the steering of the car and so on. Um, so that's just one project that we've been um, exploring. We've also looked at how it can be used for remote collaboration. Right now, um, when a complex piece of machinery is broken, typically you have to get the expert to come to the machine to fix the machine. So we used this same uh, device with the projector and the camera to allow a lay person, a person who's not experienced at all in, in this case in um, fixing dishwashers, that person can get instructions from a remote um, expert who sees what this lay person in um, her apartment is seeing. So the remote person can draw on top of physical objects in front, like the, dish, the dishwasher here, and give instructions on how to fix uh, the dishwasher remotely. So we think uh, that this uh, technology also has a lot of potential for changing the whole way that um, uh, service uh, companies service uh, equipment and uh, fix equipment that is broken and so on. Now, I mentioned that um, we're really exploring many things in parallel, and I'm sure many of you um, or have heard about Google Glass. Um, Google Glass actually, um, initially, the predecessor of Google Glass was invented also at the Media Laboratory, and in fact, the team at Google that is building Google Glass and designing uh, the whole experience is all Media Lab, or most of them are Media Lab people and the person in charge of it. One of my students also um, in 98 effectively had Google Glass, <laughs> or the, um, it was a little bit of a bigger um, design and he had a whole backpack or, or sort of a, a messenger bag with a computer and batteries and it was actually fairly complicated to do that at that time. Um, but basically already back then we were looking again at the same idea of how a computer can be more active in offering information that can be useful. How can a computer be almost an extension of your own mind? <laughs> and 
uh, it specifically what uh, Bradley Rhodes looked at was how a computer can be like an external memory, like an extended memory. So his device, the little purple device in front of his eye is a little screen. And wherever he went, based on who he was talking to, which person he was talking to, where he was in the building, and what he was talking about, the system would give him recommendations in this little screen telling him about relevant information. Like, um, for example, so he was my PhD student, and every week when I met with him, um, if we talked about a particular topic, all the related notes that he had taken in previous conversations where we talked about his thesis would come up. So um, the experience, to some extent, <laughs> was very frustrating for me because I didn't have one of these devices. And <laughs> every time when, he, um, when I would say something like, I think you should be testing your, your algorithm this way or that way, then he would say, look at this little screen and say, well, but four weeks ago, you told me that I should do it this way. And that was like <laughs> because his memory was basically much better than mine because the device was constantly reminding him of previous conversations about the same topic that he had with me and so on. And it would do that for everything. So we had a whole group of people actually at the lab at the time. 20 people were wearing these wearable um, uh, computers. And... Um, they were very committed, and they wore them uh, not day and night, but all day, definitely weekends, and so on, only included. And so that same uh, group, uh, many of the people are now uh, doing Google Glass. Um, a more recent project that we've been working on is um, a ring, basically. We, um, a lot of what we try to do in our work um, I work, by the way, not just with computer science people and electrical engineers, but we also have a lot of designers um, in uh, our lab. And so uh, we were thinking about sort of how we could naturally extend and make use of what people already do. And so, of course, one thing people do is they point at things and you ask a question like, what is that sign or where is that juice from or whose juice is this and so on. So we thought it would be useful to build um, a ring that has a camera on it, and so you can basically speak to the computer, um, or to your phone, rather, and take a picture at the same time of something and ask the computer a question about something in your environment. So it's, again, illustrating how we want the computers that we use and the smartphones that we use and so on to be more aware of what is around us, uh, the users. Um, initially, actually, we uh, uh, developed this ring for blind people uh, to give blind people an opportunity to um, sort of see <laughs> some of uh, and perceive, perceive some of their environment. So some of the types of, um, they're really apps kind of that we built were an app to recognize uh, prices and, and extract the dollar um, uh, value of a, pr a price tag or an app to recognize a dollar bill and so on. And the nice thing is that all of these apps can just be invoked by um, pointing and saying like currency or um, color or price and the system then runs uh, the app basically and speaks the answer. I have a, a video of a very early prototype. You'll see the later prototype next. But so um, you can just, you don't have to get your phone out of your pocket. Ideally, this would be a lot smaller and you can just sort of point at things, ask a question and get answers like, uh, what is the value of this dollar bill and so on. $20. Sorry, the sound is a little bit quiet. I'll turn it up. So the blind person can point it at um, a price tag and then take a picture. Tag. Tag mode selected. And then it tells, it, it extracts uh, the price information. $27. So we also since then um, realized that 
this would be very useful to have for sighted people. Imagine going, uh, like I was sightseeing in Barcelona, I, I could just point at things and ask like who's that in that sculpture um, or who built that building and so on. So it's, um, we're already getting more and more used to talking to our phones with Siri, for example. Um, but I think that um, talking or communication between people doesn't just involve uh, voice, it's also gestures and pointing and uh, the ring can pick up uh, a lot of that and, and, be, and really offer um, the user a lot more. Um, we recently um, developed an application for kids where you can take a picture of your surroundings, um, it extracts the edges and then you can color the uh, edge drawing uh, using some uh, colors that you find um, all around you. So you can first take a picture of the angry bird, for example, and it extract, it finds the lines. It's hard to see with the light, but, so, but then you can take colors from plums and, and bananas and pears and <laughs> or textures from trees and so on, and you can use those to then draw uh, the drawing uh, that you are making. So again, it's making more of a link between the digital world and the physical world around us, and which is really the common uh, theme in, in all of our work. Um, we also built a music reading app so that um, uh, somebody can learn to read music just by pointing at some paper with the ring. Uh, using the music reading app and it can either sing the notes for you or read them and tell you what they are and so on. Um, in another project, another big project in the group is, which is related to Sixth Sense, is one where we are trying to make a light bulb. <laughs> a light bulb that is a computer, a self-contained augmented reality system. Uh, the system is called Luminar. And basically, it is about the size of a big light bulb. It again includes a pickup projector, a depth camera, um, and uh, some other sensors. Um, this is a version from 2012. So it's still a little bit heavy. We had to reinforce the lamp. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes bang. <laughs> but, but so the idea is that you buy one in the store, you screw it in any uh, um, spotlight or wherever. And um, sorry, and then you have a projected, um, uh, basically gestural interface wherever you need it. You can also uh, put it on the wall and so on. And it has uh, the Wi-Fi connection, the processing, everything is on board. So it's really a computer in the form of a light bulb. Um, and so the benefits are that it disappears. You can turn it off when you don't need it. You can use it in a messy situation, like in a kitchen or something. And it's more than having touch screens everywhere because um, the system can actually recognize uh, potentially physical objects that are there, like the bottle of uh, uh, liquid and so on, and give you information related to physical objects. So it's more than a touch screen, it can, um, you can interact with physical as well as uh, digital objects. Um, uh, so we've actually used this uh, together with Best Buy um, to make a store, sort of our concept store, where uh, you can buy a camera. And whenever you pick up a camera, it notices that you picked it up. It gives you information about that camera. If you put two cameras next to each other, it tells you what the differences are. You can get reviews, et cetera. And all of that is just done uh, with the spotlight, the uh, sort of an intelligent spotlight. Um, and recently, we actually, uh, Steelcase is a company that makes a lot of uh, office furniture. And they are, um, have just recently installed some of our um, bulbs. It's a bigger version, actually, than uh, the light bulb sized one. But basically, the augmented reality system can see what that person is doing who's like 
building a table, actually, the, and uh, can give him instructions, can say, no, the table is too short, too long. You forgot to include the bag of screws, or you didn't do this right. Or, so it can actually see, um, give uh, instructions, teach the person how to make a table, but it can also capture information, then transfer that or show that to another person who's trying to build a table and learning about how to do it. And so we think that um, in addition to um, sort of having a lot of applications in the home, that this kind of augmented reality system, uh, there are a lot of commercial applications actually in uh, business and specifically in manufacturing. Um, another project related actually to uh, some of the work that David is doing here at La Salle um, is uh, this project where we are trying to um, extend sort of um, what is possible with augmented reality technology. In this case, it's just a handheld device, an iPad, which looks at the world and which can augment information about the objects that are in front of you or uh, show you information about them. But the way in which we are going further is that um, in this system, you can actually change how the real object behaves with the augmented reality interface. So it's sort of a, a system for um, basically programming the behavior of physical objects um, around you. And I'll show you the video which will explain. Touch devices provide us with a flexible graphical user interface that lets us share and interact with apps and other people. However, a graphical user interface needs our full visual attention. A tangible interface like a light switch, in contrast, can be operated just by muscle memory and the tactile feedback. Smarter objects can combine the tangible interfaces with the flexibility of graphical user interfaces using augmented reality image recognition. The smart device only requires a processor and a Wi-Fi connection to a server that binds the tangible interface with the actions of a graphical user interface. Smarter objects can enhance the concept of a traditional radio. Here we have a radio with a volume and a tuning knob. But we expect more. Nowadays we expect a rich media player. Therefore this radio has a second graphical interface layer which let us access all the functionalities we expect from a modern digital radio. Since the graphical layer is tied to the tangible interface, all changes from one are reflected on the other. Once we want to change a tuning spot, we select the song we want to place and drop it on the spot. We have now reprogrammed the radio and we can use our new selection with a tangible interface. The interface can provide online radios and music services. The tuning knob could include favorite playlists and even alarm events. Once programmed, the device can be operated without a screen. If we want to listen to a song with a better speaker, we can just draw a virtual line from the radio to the speaker, and those devices become instantly connected. Tap the line again to disconnect. This separation of interactions to tangible and graphical interfaces is effective because graphical user interfaces provide better understanding and modification of programming systems. Once a system is programmed, a user wants to operate it. The operation part can be performed better and intuitively with tangible interfaces. The concept can also be applied on a door opening system whereby a virtual access system grants access to the door. Or enhancing a simple light switch whereby the light switch only triggers on and off but the graphical user interfaces changes the light color. We envision that the virtual interaction layer supports all interfaces and interaction one can perform at home, garden, or at work. So yeah, there's a real tendency to, or a very a strong interest in making the objects around us smart and internet enabled and so on. But the problem is that we don't want to have a little interface and a little 
um, screen for every object like a thermostat or the light switches in the room and so on. So what we did here is that um, we have a regular objects with regular buttons and knobs and so on, but then the interface is basically virtual um, and you can pro reprogram or change the meaning of the buttons and the settings of the buttons and what the knobs do using the virtual interface. Um, and you can really program interactions between different objects in a room uh, um, or even between digital events and uh, physical events and so on. You can say, every time I get an email or I, every time I have 10 new emails, uh, turn the lights on and off quickly, stuff like that. So you can basically control and program and automate uh, your whole environment because all of these uh, physical objects are uh, basically uh, can be reprogrammed and what they do and how they interact can all be reprogrammed with this simple graphical uh, user language that is uh, fairly easy to learn. Um, We've also been doing a lot of work on um, collaboration interfaces for um, improving collaboration between people. And I'll show a video next of a, a system that we've been working on for a while called Wazam, which is sort of like Skype, except that it puts two people in the same virtual world. So you can create a virtual world, and then you can both, two remote uh, users can inhabit that world. Hi, my name is Seth Hunter from the MIT Media Lab. What you just saw is a creative telepresence system called Wazam. Wazam is like Skype plus Connect plus your imagination. Plug the Connect into your PC, connect your PC to the TV, and Wazam, you can connect to other people in your network. In Wazam, what you see is what I see. The magic of Wazam is that we can do things together in the same space. I asked Chris and Brendan from Boston Improv to demonstrate some of the possibilities. That's the Brendan, I can't figure out how to roll my R in French. Can you help me? Yeah, so it's like that in the back of your throat. No. Somebody called the police. Call the police. Somebody call the police. They're just gonna leave him? Oh, somebody do something! No! Let all the strings go open on your left hand. Okay, and, and just, just strum it. Mm -hmm. Just all strum right. it. Wow, look at them go. Man, they, oh these guys God. are some Goodness. of the fastest Paralympic runners in the world. In yep. fact, they are the fastest. So, what do you think? You wanna, you wanna sublet? Um, you know, I, I'm actually gonna look around a little bit. I'm not, I don't think I'm interested in this place, but thanks. This place is amazing. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying I don't know if it's for me, Chris. <laughs> What makes Wazam unique is that it allows you to connect with others in more creative and meaningful ways. You can use puppets to improvise and tell stories. You can customize yourself and the environment. You can use gestures to transform yourself. We're just beginning to explore the possibilities of what we could do with this platform. What would you do with Wazam? Tell us at www.wazam.com. So yeah, we're looking for more collaborators on that one if other people want to try using this at a distance. Um, some of our other projects, we've done a lot also with exploring um, sort of different form factors for computers that are easier to manipulate because a lot of what we do with data is that we want to organize it or sort it or whatever. And well, now we can use a touch screen, but often we're also using the mouse. So you're trying to like sort all your pictures by going like this, or instead of just being able to touch the pictures and move them around and sort them in different buckets. So we thought, um, and this was David Merrill's uh, work um, in my group, what if instead of one big screen, uh, we have many little screens so that you can actually uh, manipulate your data really with your hands um, and sort and organize things. Like, for example, at the bottom is like um, um, some like process uh, uh, definition of a process for a company, uh, business process, and you can just move things around and change this with your hands. Um, 
this, I particularly like this example, actually, where um, kids uh, can basically play with numbers and arithmetic just by moving uh, the different objects around. And um, these little cubes have uh, gesture, um, recognize some gestures as well. So you can change like a plus into a minus and so on, um, like there. They talk to their neighbors and so on. So we've developed a whole set of applications, basically, where people um, can use, um, sort of manipulate their data just with their hands as opposed to having to do it in an indirect way via a computer mouse. And uh, we've done things like um, video editing with this, um, uh, using Photoshop and different filters and so on. There's a lot of um, things we do that naturally sort of translate uh, to this environment. These days, uh, the student who did that PhD started a company, so you can actually buy these um, online um, from the company Siftio. Um, Hasbro, the toy manufacturer, it was a sponsor of the Media Lab. They also made a, a product, a commercial product, uh, based on our invention uh, that you can buy in the stores. Um, a related project actually done by two people from La Salle is to take this to three dimensions. Um, so we're, um, we basically have been building these display cubes, uh, cubes that have six displays so that you can see um, uh, the projections from all different sides or maybe can even look inside of uh, Paul, uh, Paul's brain here and so on. Uh, so the idea is to really have something like Lego blocks, but that have uh, videos basically on all sides um, so that um, you can maybe stack things and build, uh, maybe for the architecture people here, um, build different models. Um, uh, so uh, it's really like more flexible Lego blocks basically, and that also um, uh, eventually, we'll be able to know what their, who their neighbors are and how they are being manipulated and so on. Um, and um, I think I have one, uh, one more project here that I want to show. Um, again, talking about uh, or related to this idea of the physical and the digital world and how we can blend them better. Um, and again, maybe the architecture students uh, here will be interested in this. Um, so today's office is typically still fairly cluttered with books and posters and paper everywhere and stuff. And uh, we use all that space. Like, you know, like, oh, my books about uh, algorithms are on that shelf and the books about human computer interaction are on that shelf and so on and my papers are over there and my files over there but we're increasingly <laughs> living in this world where everything is digitized so all our books all our files all our information it's all basically we have to access it via this one screen sort of and we're no longer taking advantage of the fact that we have that we are people <laughs> and that we have uh, that we sort of don't just see like this but that we have a we can feel things and we we can experience the whole world around us and so on um, and so i think that this vision is not at all exciting and it's really frustrating because it's hard to remember where things are in your computer and you don't get a, a sense of sort of where the stuff is and you don't know, sort of, you don't have a good feeling of what is going on in the online world. Um, personally, I find it extremely frustrating. So, one small project that we have done to sort of think about this is to um, build these little screens again, sort of like the siftables um, or like the display cubes. Uh, they're basically little screens that we call cloud drops because they are kind of like a drop of information from um, the cloud, the information cloud. Um, a drop of information that stays updated all the time and can keep you informed about something that you care about. So for example, you have many uh, Facebook friends or whatever, and yeah, you can go to Facebook uh, maybe or, and, and see what's going on with them. 
but some people um, are, you, you would want to have a special little um, display for because you want to know where your girlfriend is or something at all times and whether she's called you or, or um, stuff like that. So we uh, um, have been using these little displays that stay, that are Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, they're basically built on top of the WIM watch, which unfortunately is no longer available. And, Android, uh, Android device that is a watch uh, that is reprogrammable. Um, but so you can basically, the idea is that you have a whole bunch of these and they're kind of like, um, I mean like the sticky notes except that they're digital and their information can be updated all the time. Um, so for example, uh, we also augmented them by putting a camera on the back and you can take something like a bus schedule and take a picture with the camera on the back of the cloud drop of the uh, visual tag, and then it knows that it's associated with that paper document, and it will tell you when the next bus is coming. So next bus in 10 minutes, nine minutes, etc. So it stays updated all the time. So it's a dedicated little display for important information. Um, I am always late, <laughs> so um, I want one at my door that says, we'll be back at, but then I can update it from my phone so that I can correct it, that I'm actually going to be there at 4 or 5 or 4.10. <laughs> um, so we'll see a little video of uh, how you can easily associate it with information uh, on the web, so with your inbox, with uh, eBay, uh, with email and so on, and the little displays are updated so that your inbox will show you um, how many messages you have. That little display shows that. So like here, for example, if you delete uh, one or your to-do list can be shown on one of them. Um, and you can also do some simple interactions actually as well with the little displays. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to see there. Um, you can put a bunch of them together. We basically um, have technology to let them talk to each other. And then you can um, sort of use several of them to attract the user's attention and so on. So we use them for keeping track of the online status of people. Um, and you can do some do some simple reading of messages and so on right there on the device. So it's staying in touch with another person, getting the attention of another remote person and so on. Um, so you have eBay, you can see what an, an item is valued at um, on eBay that you've been following. And so and you can associate them with physical documents, like I said, like the bus sc schedule and so on, by taking a picture of the tag and then it knows which document it's associated with. But so Right now, they're still fairly expensive, but our idea is that these would be as um, sort of disposable almost like as uh, sticky notes so that, uh, or reusable at least, recyclable, so that you have a whole bunch of them. And whenever you need to keep track of something, you just use one of these to keep track of some information that is changing. And um, then when you no longer need to keep track of that, you recycle it and use it for a different purpose. So in summary, I think that the devices and the interfaces that we are using today, the way we are interacting with smartphones, laptops, computers, is really uh, lacking. And I mean, we're increasingly using all this technology all the time. So increasingly, we're all just looking at a little screen wherever we are, um, rather than sort of 
enjoying the whole beautiful <laughs> environment uh, around you and being able to really use, make use of information and services while you uh, use all your senses and um, sort of perceive everything around you. So I think increasingly tomorrow um, that uh, we will have other form factors for working with information, um, form factors that are more of a natural extension of people and the way we do things and uh, devices that really are a lot more proactive in giving us information uh, that may be useful to whatever we're doing uh, right now. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer some questions. one or yeah people in the back congratulations for the job uh, in one of your projects you talk about extending uh, census okay we are in a project with a guy called Neil Harbison he calls mm. himself the first uh, cybernetic man in the wall okay my question is how far are you from a cybernetic wall well i think it's a very interesting question i think all of us are cyborgs actually already <laughs> because and and I, but i think we we don't realize this or think about it enough um, basically i do not know the telephone number of my son how is that possible? It's because my phone knows the telephone number of my son. It used to be that phones didn't remember telephone numbers, so then you had to um, learn them by heart. But now I cannot tell you what my son's phone number is. So I'm already a cyborg. I need my phone, and I could probably, well, I could survive without my phone, but it's, it's definitely making uh, life more difficult. And I think we... Um, we are increasingly relying on all of this technology, and, but it's sort of happening very gradually so that we don't stand still and think about it, but it is happening. And um, I mean, some people think it's a worrisome thing. Um, other people, like for example, um, uh, uh, there's, um, why can't I think of his name? Um, a philosopher um, in England, uh, Andy Clark. Uh, who wrote a book called Naturally Born Cyborgs. And he argues that the only thing that distinguishes people from other animals is the fact that we increase our capabilities with technology. We invent tools like writing um, and reading and other types of technologies that make it so that we can do a lot more than we could do just with our own natural uh, capabilities. So he claims that this is our sort of our destiny, that that is what makes us uh, powerful, or <laughs> that uh, basically we, we improve our, and, and extend our natural keep capabilities with tools that we invent. And those tools can then again allow us to uh, invent even more powerful tools and so on. So he says that, um, that this is uh, sort of the, a natural tendency that, that we as people have. Um, but yeah, I, I think we have to think about this a little bit more deliberately, um, and, and we don't do that enough. And, and I think we're already changing who we are. Um, some um, uh, psychologists, um, uh, like there's a, a professor at Columbia University called Betsy Sparrow, and she has been studying how people learn with or without computers. And if they read something on a computer and they read the same thing in a book, they actually process the information differently. And the reason is that when they read it in a book, 
they're not sure that they will have access to it again later. So you read some stuff and you think, oh, I have to remember this because it's a book, say, that I got from someone else and I may not have that information again. But if you read it on the computer, people don't read it as deeply because they say, well, I just am going to figure out what is in this book or article uh, so that if I, real, if I need information later, I'll just look it up again and then I'll read whatever I need. So there's, I think there's um, so much happening that <laughs> we're not sort of aware of and we're not thinking about enough. Uh, so much happening in the sense of how um, computers and, and phones and everything are changing who we are, how we live our lives, how we learn, and all of that. And um, so it's important to have more discussions about that, I think, and be more aware of all of that. Yeah. Here at the back. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Patty, for your talk. I think it was very inspiring. I was wondering uh, where do those brilliant ideas come from? I mean, do they come from the researcher, from perhaps students, <laughs> companies, brainstormings? Yeah, it's a, a very good question. I think um, the Media Lab, and, and those of you that have been there may have seen that or felt it, but is, um, it is a unique place in that we have, uh, we bring a lot of people together with very different backgrounds. In most universities, um, un the university and the research is organized by department. So you have the computer scientists and you have the, uh, the architects and designers and, um, and so on. So you have all these people in different departments and they don't really talk to each other. But at the Media Lab, we try to, within one research group, even ideally within one person, find people who are both engineers and designers. Um, so, and I think that a lot of the innovation actually at the lab comes from the fact that they are forced to sit together, work on the projects together, um, and they have very different ways of looking at uh, the world and at the work, <laughs> at the, the work they're doing. Um, I used to work in uh, the computer science um, department at MIT, and over there, people think that human-computer interaction is like that's like lower level. It's not important enough, and uh, it's not real computer science. And um, and the people there will invent technologies, but they invent stuff that nobody else wants to use. Only engineers want to use it because it's, hor I mean, it's designed for engineers by engineers. Um, while if you go to a design or an arts department, then you have people that have lots of creativity and lots of ideas, but they don't know how to make highly sophisticated technical things. They don't know much about uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and so on. So usually those two worlds are very separate. And at the Media Lab, we bring that all together in one mix and we force people to work together. And I think that that is actually one of the uh, secrets <laughs> sort of of the lab. Um, I think there's some other things as well. We, we have a philosophy of um, rapid prototyping. Um, and so when we have a particular idea, uh, like if you take the Sixth Sense device, we were just sitting around at a meeting, a group meeting, talking about some other technology uh, developed by Oblong um, uh, that is like very elaborate and, and also allows gestural interaction uh, with information, but it's very expensive. You have to go to a special room, you have to wear gloves and so on. And we were saying, well, why couldn't you like just have a projector on your head and a camera? Because then you could just do things and you could have it wherever you are. You could like have this gestural information, this uh, gestural interface. So that's how that idea came about. And like 48 hours later, two days later, we had a prototype. Um, so that's how we work. It wasn't doing much. It was just sort of a, a helmet with a big projector <laughs> built into the helmet and a camera and it was it looked crazy and and but it allowed us to think about it and then we said oh i guess it doesn't really make sense to have it on the head because then 
if you look at another person, you're blinding them with a projector and you can't really show them information and talk to them because you're showing the information right there. So we, then we said, oh, I guess it should be around the neck because if it's around the neck, another person can also look at it while you show um, information. So we just have this, um, it's a very, uh, this, this uh, very interactive uh, style of developing work where we build prototypes and rebuild them and take them apart and critique them. And it's always group work. Um, almost all the projects are group projects. Um, and we are constantly talking about the work and constantly showing it to people, saying, what do you think? What would you do with this? And so on, and getting feedback, rebuilding it. So we, we have a very unique style. Uh, back when I was studying uh, computer science, um, maybe because I, I literally still learned on a mainframe <laughs> with uh, uh, cards and everything, but it was totally the opposite. You had to do all the thinking first, and then you had, and really like even debugging on paper, and then you would type in your program and, and like print it on cards to be executed <laughs> by the computer. So. But you had to do all the planning first, and then it was just execution. And I think our style is just completely the opposite. We play, and we sort of playfully invent stuff, and then from that come other ideas and so on. So it's not so much thought out in advance, or uh, at first the ideas never sound very good. It's only after a lot of iteration that they uh, get somewhere. Yeah. Question there. Hi, over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's me. Yeah. So, uh, Jose San Pedro from Telefonica Research. Uh, really interesting stuff. Um, so, I'm, when I'm, I'm seeing all these projects, and all of them present a kind of a different interaction mm. paradigm for the user. And that is, of course, adding uh, another layer of complexity. And in mm -hmm. contrast, we have the classic view of mouse plus windows mm -hmm. uh, so if you uh, kind of fit yeah. your application in that paradigm everybody sort of kind of interact with your application now we're adding all this complexity mm. so do you think this um, because this is this is probably going to be the future do you think this going towards uh, also a uh, unique paradigm or maybe we're going to be uh, improving the interaction mm -hmm. design so that things are very intuitive to use, even though they're, they mm -hmm. present a different yeah. uh, interaction paradigm. Yeah. So yeah, I feel that we have not necessarily found sort of the, the best idea yet. So we are exploring many different things. And I'm not sure whether in the future, um, I do think that we will actually have multiple devices that maybe we interact with in different ways, rather than having this one device that can do everything for us. Um, because we are, it's just hard to, everything, to have everything right there on the screen, reminders about stuff and so on. We're not making use of our other senses. Maybe computers should be like giving us warmth to tell us, I don't know, that something is happening that we should take care of. Or we're, we're only using the visual sense, only using this tiny little surface area to take care of our entire lives. And uh, so I, I think that uh, we have to start thinking more about um, different devices on the body, different devices in the environment and so on, so that we take, make more use of sort of our physical presence um, in the interactions with information. But we haven't necessarily found uh, the ultimate solution yet. Um, yeah. Hi, Patti. Uh, I've seen many interesting projects you've presented here, but I haven't seen any that makes use of flexible screens, maybe because mm. it's a too young technology. Uh, how do you think that flexible screens can improve our interaction with, yeah. with objects on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually have some work in the area, but I decided not to <laughs> include it in uh, the talk. But um, 
I do think, I mean, I've been trying to convince uh, some of our sponsors like Samsung and LG to give us access to some of their flexible displays. Um, I think that there are um, several sort of types of flexible displays. One is just a display that is curved, but that isn't necessarily bendable. So uh, then there are the bendable displays that, um, of course, have the advantage. Well, a curved display would have the advantage that, for example, you can have one around the pillar there, or you can have one around your wrist a display um, that uh, gives you notifications of what's going on maybe online while I'm giving a talk here or something. Um, uh, so the, the bendable displays, the flexible displays have the advantage that you could fold them and just make something bigger when you need it, uh, make the display bigger when you need it, like when you're watching a video or when you're uh, looking at a map, but you can make it smaller if it just needs to be a phone and so on. Then there's also rollable displays. That's sort of a third category, which I think for uh, architects, for example, would be extremely interesting if you, I mean, right now, architects design on the computer, but they still uh, have to print out their plans uh, for their meetings with the contractors and the clients and so on. What if your big um, rollable paper would actually be electronic and could be so that you could make changes to the plans right there and then, and then roll it up again and take it with you. So I, there's many um, different uh, usages we've, uh, done a project in our lab uh, with, it wasn't with a truly flexible display. We simulate flexible displays with a projector that projects onto just something white, uh, like a white piece of paper. Um, and we did one project where um, you can basically take, for example, a volume of data, like MRI data of a body, say, and then you could just go through uh, this volume of data and see slices through the data by just moving your piece of paper around, bending it to see like the curvature of the spine in the MRI data and so on. So there's uh, special purpose applications definitely for, for these bendable displays as well. Uh, but one of our uh, collaborators who was visiting us for a year uh, Jürgen Steimler is his um, name. He's done, if you look up his website, he's back in Germany now. He um, is sort of one of the world's uh, experts in thinking of use cases and usage um, uh, or user experience for flexible and bendable displays. Yeah. Displays which are interactive, multi-touchscreen, are have been around for at least ten years, but mm. you don't see them anywhere. Mm. No, there. Um, I mean, we also uh, did some work on tabletops, and usually you have a fairly big um, sort of setup. You have to calibrate the projectors and so on. I mean, maybe the newest Microsoft Surface. Uh, well, they don't call it Surface anymore now because their other thing is called Surface. But whatever it's called now, their table, interactive table, may be more usable. But um, so far, these systems were always expensive. You had to use them in one spot. So everybody has to go to that table and use that table. If you happen to sit around a different table, you don't cannot make use of it. Um, Another problem is that the table, typically you want to see some data, text, for example, and then only people on one side can read the text and so on. So there's, there's definitely uh, several limitations uh, um, to these tables. So I'm not sure to what extent we'll, we'll start seeing more use for them or not. I do think that in, well, in architecture and landscape design and so on, there's definitely very interesting use cases. But even there, you would have to bring your clients or whoever you're, you're having a meeting with to your table, because you can't just bring the table to them. So. 
Thank you. Thanks again for this interesting conference. Thank you. Thanks.